So should this video be called Maybe It Is A Tin? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm a philosopher, right? So I'm not going to give you really definite, <laughs> definite answers. I'm just going to be saying it's super hard to know. But I think in general, you know, some philosophers think that it's just not possible at all for AI to be conscious. And I don't think that at all. I think any sensible theory of consciousness basically doesn't tie it to anything essential to human beings. It's not like you have to have this wet brain or anything like that. Mark, it is brilliant to have you back on Computerfile. Here we are again. Yeah, um, I'm glad to be back here. It's um, been a while, hasn't it? It has. And, and uh, look, let's get it out of the way straight away. There'll be some people out there who don't want to watch Humanities. It is really relevant for this, right? I think this is going to be really interesting because there's this strong link between philosophy, philosophy of mind, AI and computer science. So hopefully we can cover all of that. Fantastic. And so we've done this recent video about a certain chatbot, effectively, that's, yeah. you know, uh, yeah, it claims, somebody claims sentience, and we went through a technical side of that. I think that when it was claimed this might be sentient, they weren't worrying about the definition. They were really trying to... There were lots of people thing. saying in the comments on the technical video that perhaps the, that Mike wasn't qualified to answer some of the more philosophical questions. So here we go. I can try. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that um, has come up... Again, Again and again is is this link back to the Turing test, right? Yes. Yeah, so test. let's just can we just pray see what the Turing test is and whether it's still relevant? Yeah, so this is the idea from, from Alan Turing that basically we can test for intelligence, for artificial intelligence, by effectively just doing a blind test. We have a uh, a human interpreter who's going to be asking questions and getting answers back and maybe one way of setting it up is you have one bunch of answers coming from a human respondent another bunch of answers coming from an artificial respondent and the interpreter has to try and work out is one of them human is one of them a computer if she can't tell the difference between them then we're basically going to have to say that yeah this artificial system is intelligence or at least that's turing's idea computing has moved on since uh, turing's time it has, but you could still think there's something to this idea. I mean, effectively, it's saying if you can't be distinguished from an intelligent human, then you might, for all intents and purposes, be an intelligent system. But there is this sense that what we're looking at doing there is tricking, right? If I'm trying to design a system to pass the Turing test, then I'm thinking, how can I trick this human interpreter into just passing me? And, you know, tricking somebody into passing you isn't the same thing as actually being intelligent. Okay, and the other thing that kind of cropped up quite a bit in the kind of uh, comments section on the previous video was about this idea of kind of persistent memory. Is, right, is that yeah. relevant? Because people have amnesia and they're still sentient, right? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So in philosophy, when we're talking about personal identity, the idea of the continuance of, of memory and other conscious features, that's really important. But that's more about being the same person over time. So why am I the same person I was yesterday or when I was a 10 year old? Well, a lot of that is to do with my, my memories and my continuance of, of consciousness. But that's not the same thing as being intelligent or being sentient or even being conscious. And, and maybe you can have a system or even a person who is conscious at a particular time and then suffers some, you know, terrible m mental catastrophe and then loses consciousness and then maybe regains consciousness they're still conscious and intelligent and sentient at those times even if they're not necessarily the same person over time one interesting thing is we named the last video and literally this was the name of the video no it's not sentient <laughs> i mean <Right. laughs> can we can we actually say that for sure it's super hard to know i mean there are different things going on here there's intelligence which I think you've got to say maybe some computer systems are intelligent, at least at certain things. There's sentience and there's consciousness, and they're slightly different than intelligence. To be sentient or to be conscious it isn't just to give intelligent answers in response to questions, but it's to feel something, right? When you are conscious of something, if you're conscious of like the way the wind feels right now, I'm feeling it. And it's a big, big leap to say that any kind of artificial system, any kind of AI is really feeling the stuff. So even if it's saying, oh, I'm really enjoying this conversation, is it really feeling the enjoyment in the way that, you know, a conscious human would? We've done a few videos, quite a series of videos on AI safety and the idea of the worry, what happens when artificial general intelligence happens and if it happens before we even know it. Yeah. Would we even know that this system is sentient? 
I mean, that's a real tricky one. So there's this kind of prior question that I always think there, which is, how do I know that you're sentient? How do I know that you're conscious? So I know that I'm conscious because I feel it, right? I, I'm feeling the wind, I'm feeling like a toothache or whatever, but I never get to get inside your head and feel that. But I assume that you feel all the same things as me. And that's roughly because I'm maybe thinking to myself, well, why do you behave the way you do? So why is it that when, you know, you feel the cold, you start shivering and put warm clothes on, and when someone treads on your foot, you say, ow, and do all those things that I would, well, in some ways, maybe I can't say a hundred percent for sure, but it seems the best explanation of why you behave that way is because you're feeling roughly the same things that I do. So that's inference the best explanation. The best explanation of why you act in the way you do in them circumstances is because you're feeling roughly the same kind of things as me, because you're a conscious person. That's why you behave the way you do. That kind of argument, that kind of way of getting knowledge of consciousness isn't going to be so smooth with artificial systems because they don't behave the way we do, right? They don't react to the cold or to toothache or whatever in the way that we do. So that's not saying that we can't know they're conscious. It, it just makes it much, much harder. It's a bit like meeting an alien intelligence or something. We don't know how it's going to perceive things. We don't know it's going to, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, that's it. And you know, you kind of, when you, when you kind of, on, on TV, right, when, when creatures, uh, you know, when we encounter aliens in, in, in sci-fi, the kind of default is if they kind of look a bit like us and behave a bit like us, the kind of default assumption is, well, they feel roughly the same kind of stuff that we do. But when it's kind of robots or if it just doesn't look or behave like us, it's much, much harder to make those inferences. So that's not saying that those creatures, those AI systems or whatever, aren't sentient, that they aren't conscious. It just makes it harder for us to know. Is it a spectrum? Is there a kind of like a sliding scale of this consciousness? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So, you know, just looking at the things that we do think are conscious, right? So all the different animals from, from small to large, from less complex to more complex, uh, pretty much very few philosophers nowadays think that there's this sharp cut off between, you know, humans who are conscious and all the other ones who aren't conscious. That, you know, you, you kind of assume that your, your, your dogs and your cats, they, they, feel, they feel pain, they feel attachment, they feel emotions. Um, you know, that's why you definitely shouldn't be cruel to them. But they probably don't have the same kind of detailed life plans, career plans and stuff that humans have. So, you know, there is this scale of consciousness probably right down to real basic sentience. I mean, in some sense, plants are sentient of the sun because they, they turn towards it and they reach for it. You know, so when we're talking about artificial intelligence, artificial sentience, yeah, that whole spectrum is out there. So. You know, we're not saying that any AI has kind of human level consciousness, but maybe now or maybe at some point in the future, we're talking about these basic forms of, of, of sentience. You know, maybe just a, an AI system thinking, I don't want to get turned off tonight or, you know, I, I don't want the power to go off or whatever. Consciousness is in effect computing a function, right? The, the, the most prominent theory, philosophical theory of consciousness is functionalism. That's basically saying to be to be conscious, your brain has to compute this function. And this idea ties in really closely with Turing machines. And one of the things about Turing machines is we don't really care too much about how they're implemented, whether it's with ones and zeros or, or however it's done. You can do it with regi register machines or bits of tape, whatever. It doesn't really matter. The important thing is the function that's being computed. And that's what a lot of philosophers think now about the mind and the brain. It's not exactly how the brain works that's important, it's the function that it's being computed. So if you took any kind of system, any kind of machine that computes the same function as a human brain, it would have to be conscious in exactly the same way that human brains are. You know, they would feel the same thing. It's just a very, very, very complicated function. <laughs> Well, I was thinking that, yeah, because our uh, ones and zeros are cells and our kind of like logic gates, our neurons. Right, exactly. and, but we are a machine in some sense, yeah. In some sense, we're a machine, yeah, computing this function. It's just a very, very nuanced, complicated one. Uh, you know, it's not the kind of thing that you could easily write down. Even just writing it down in terms of like input output rules or anything like that, it's, it's super, super, super difficult.
I'm a computer scientist, I'm a philosopher, I'm a logician. You run your own channel, so tell us a bit about that, what do you do? Okay, so it's called Attic Philosophy because I'm up in my attic talking philosophy and logic. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, you want to see some more philosophy, some more logic related to computer science, come and take a look.